Good evening, welcome to the Photographer Academy and another Talk Photography. I'm going to be joined by John Humphrey very, very soon. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, eight abstract images and things really. So uh, I, was I was lucky enough to listen to John at the uh, photography show last year. And uh, uh, I'm glad that Laura ran off and kind of gave him or shoved a card in his hand and they basically begged and stole him to come and do a, web a webinar for us. Uh, a big name within our industry um, we'll kind of have a little chat and things ready, but uh, John, are you there? Come on in. Yes, I am. Are you hearing me? I am. Show us your webcam. I'm clicking a button. There we there are. There you go. Well, what a, what a, what a build-up, uh, Mark. It's going to be downhill from now. <laughs> Look, at my age in life and your age in life, everything's downhill from now. So let's make the most <laughs> That's of it. True, yes. <laughs> uh, John, um, before we get going into the images, we usually do a quick chat on kind of tell us a little bit about you, tell us a little bit about your photo history, uh, if that's okay. Where did it all begin for you? It began, um, it began about um, 70 years ago in the cupboard under the stairs in Wembley, um, where I, my father taught me to develop film in teacups. Um, and then we blacked out the kitchen and printed our pictures using a homemade enlarger. So uh, although photography hasn't been my professional life for most of my life, uh, it's it's been a, a part of my life from my earliest memories. I the good old a, days of under the stairs developing, eh? Oh, yes. And we had a homemade glazing sheet. Do you remember glazing sheets? I, yeah, the ones with the uh, the little cloth on it and things. Really. Yeah, I, mine was that was a tea cloth, um, and it was heated by um, by a, a, a tungsten filament bulb underneath it. So um, yeah, it was good primitive stuff. And and then we've got Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> and and oh, yes, that, came, that came a bit later. Yeah, kind of thing with it. Um, so uh, as far as the world of photography, uh, kind of man and boy. Are you act active in the kind of the world of photography as far as clubland is concerned and things really? Uh, yes, if if by clubland you mean uh, camera clubs. Sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I'm still a member of our camera club. It's still, um, uh, in many ways, one of my driving forces. And in fact, I found that camera club, when I retired from my mainstream profession, which was in healthcare. Um, the camera club was, you know, route back into um, some more earnest photography, and then uh, photography became more um, more active in terms of what I lectured on and wrote on. So uh, it it became increasingly dominant in my post retirement years. So if we take you back to the kind of the er the early beginnings of your photography, what kind of stuff were you photographing, and what was your passion? I suppose, well, um, in, in, in my sort of working life, I guess my photography would either have been, frankly, just recording the family in the best way I could, um, or I suppose landscape photography and sometimes travel photography. Um, and but more recently, it has become, if I specialize in anything, I guess it would be in close up and macro photography. Um, that was the subject of uh, my first photography book, um, and 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 it was the subject I lectured on, uh, and now it's migrated more into more sort of arty and uh, and and quite often abstract photography. Brilliant. And how was the transition for you from black and white to color, and then color to digital? Did you kind of transcend them? Did you embrace them? Did you fear them? What were your kind of experiences? Yes, I've I've always loved the change. Um, I the the, the only challenge for me with moving from black and white to color was that uh, color developing homemade home developing of color film is difficult, and I I never really mastered it. You know, with this precise temperature control, so I became less of a do-it-yourself developer uh, when uh, when I moved to color film. Um, and then, of course, that all changed with digital. When you, you instead of light rooms, you could instead of uh, dark rooms, you could work in light rooms. And so now I do all my own printing, and um, uh, you know, in a sense, I'm much more hands-on thanks to uh, digital. Right. And and on the realm of printing, as such, really, any kind of preferred 
a paper or style or kind of look and feel what's what's your output going on i there's a bewildering range of of papers available um and so i've settled on a few that i'm familiar with but i i tend to like quite arty textured papers for my sort of work i think they uh I think the the illusion of a painted image is uh, is more easy on a on a rough textured paper. So I quite like te highly textured. Usually not on canvas, but I do like textured papers. How about you? What's your preference? Rough rag again. Funny enough, yeah. uh, it, and, yeah. and, and even though I, I use Hannah Muller, I still go down to the art shop and basically print directly onto a art paper. Um, I've 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 always kind of enjoyed, but that tends to be a softer. Uh, finish on that rather than a hard uh, kind of a rough yeah. rag kind of thing with it. But, that, that, um, you, 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 and presumably you have to coat that paper to do that? Varnish it. No, I, I don't. In fact, before I print it, it just prints wow. straight away on it, but I varnish wow. it following. Impressive. Um, no, well, I, I only um, kind of stumbled onto that. I, God, I've forgotten his name now. Um, used to sit on the Salvation Army stand and <laughs> focus on imaging. And basically do all the Photoshop demonstrations. Oh my God! I oh, I me. actually think I know exactly who you mean. I I think he's trained me to some extent in Photoshop, and I too, I'm ashamed to say, can't remember his name. Oh, he he passed away about five or six years ago now. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've forgotten. Is in that it'll come to me. Um, but yeah. yeah, I I basically was shooting a lot of landscape photography and. Um, I was looking, uh, we were chatting before we went live, and I, I was doing a little bit of um, just photography for myself when I was kind of retired. And I thought, you know what, perhaps work on another fellowship panel, because uh, my first one was in portraiture. So I began to actually look at my landscape. And uh, because I was in digital and blah, blah, blah with it and things really, I, I, I submitted a digital panel uh, printing onto uh, just an art paper and had yeah. no issues at all, really. Uh, obviously, if you go onto it and you're going to do that, it's going to fall off. Uh, but as soon as you get a little bit of varnish, I never had any real trouble with it. Um, oh, interesting. But, uh, oh, was it Barry? No. Don't, I don't think it was a Barry. It'll Barry Webb? To... Was it Barry Webb? Oh, I've forgotten his name now. It's going to be killing me. Or, <laughs> I don't sleep enough as it is. Anyway, um, but yeah, you know, the transition, I think... Uh, um, it, it, it's good. How, how are you, before we get going, how are you seeing the next transition? Because AI is literally in the dawn, if not a meteor has just landed on Earth. Uh, it depends on on how quickly people embrace it. What's, what's your thoughts on AI? I think AI is a scary um, prospect for, for all of the creative arts, you know, for, for painting, for music, for... Uh, uh, for, for anything that um, that we used to think required a human creative brain, AI is muscling its way in, um, and it, and it's chilling to, uh, to 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 experience AI in action. We've seen that already in you know in the Sony Photographic Awards. Yeah. Um, so I think our challenge is going to have to be to to somehow stay ahead of that game and to demonstrate that humans still have something to offer here. And I think, you, uh, you know, I think things like camera clubs will, will, will do that, you know, apart from producing great pictures, uh, photography is an opportunity to, to meet people, to discuss ideas, to talk about images. And I think that if AI has created some of them, we may, we may end up having to live with that. But I do. I kind of fear it. Maybe that's a bit old school. But I'm uh, I'm worried about uh, the way it will influence all creativity. Look at black and white photography, though, isn't it? It's still here today. It's probably more yeah. passionate yes. than ever before. So you know, color comes along. The death of black and white photography. Blah blah blah. You know, and so on with it. Um, but you know, still today, I'm a black and white photographer in my heart always will be i suppose uh in in a documentary level and uh, we might have it? we might have to take up sculpture mark i think ai will be hard pressed no, no i tried that <laughs> <laughs> uh, i did two years of pottery i bet i'm a better photographer uh i'll, I'll leave it like that kind of thing with it okay. you know but, All right. um, uh, what's the discussions going on in the camera club uh to do with ai how are they discussing things 
uh, my, my, my own experience is the is that mostly denial. Um, I mean, I, I I still have camera club uh, colleagues who um, who think that um, Photoshop is cheating. So uh, I, I think I think they, they they won't even be able to to tolerate the uh, the intrusion of AI. We've dodged and burned from the beginning of time in some way yeah, or another. Yeah, so yeah, whether yeah. it's in photography or something else, we've dodged and burned. Yeah. Right, let's crack yeah. on, shall we? Uh, John, yeah. let's go with the first image. Uh, great to chat with you already. Thank you. Um, first image. Right. First image is a picture of New Street Station in Birmingham. Um, and of course, it's a reflection. There was some metal cladding um, alongside the station and of course it was an opportunity to take um, a, a number of pictures and this I thought was the one that uh, did two things first of all it best represented the the idea of the station in action and secondly I thought compositionally it was the strongest uh, you can see the panels and you can see the um, the rivets in the panels uh, within the picture which I I personally like because it indicates you know what the picture is really about while still remaining abstract and it was a, a little bit of a grab shot I went um, with a friend to, to Birmingham we were actually revisiting our old university together uh, uh, so this is a shot with uh, a bridge camera um, but I felt it was an interesting enough picture to include in uh, in in this uh, selection are you a fan of iPhone or smartphone photography at all, or are you always on a camera? No, I'm coming around to uh, to smartphone because I now realise that my smartphone, which to be fair I bought because it had a good camera, uh, can manage a great deal. It, it, may, it almost makes photography a little bit too easy, um, but uh, it, it does produce remarkable uh, high resolution images. So yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, if 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 it does the job, why not use it? And it's it is, of course, the camera that you do always have with you. Um, question coming through: Abstract photography, art for art's sake. That's the question, uh, Mark. <laughs> well, I, I've I've all, you know I I um I, I had to enter well I didn't have to I entered a competition for abstract photography and you know um you know sometimes the more you think about a word the more its meaning completely escapes you um and I and I thought what what is abstract photography anyway uh, I had to had to look up a definition the Tate Gallery's definition of of abstract um and. It, and it's, I boiled it down to, to saying, well, it, it, an abstract image is where the subject is not the point of the picture. The, the picture is the point of the picture. So if that means it's art for art's sake, then then yes, yes, if, if I'm interpreting the question properly. I think so. I, well, photography is photography's sake, isn't it? I mean, we can... Uh, interpret these things as we want isn't it um so are, are you always um so the the abstract photograph this is a question from me now uh, the abstract photograph is it um what you see in front of you or are you conceiving images as well for later post-production or how does your brain tick on that uh usually it is the latter and i'll, I'll take a picture knowing that I'm going to do something with it and these days because I've done quite a lot of it knowing roughly what I am going to do with it although sometimes you you experiment um to uh, to, to to see what you can make of something but but usually I'll take a, a straight picture with an a more abstract idea in mind this in fact is an exception to that this is a straight picture um where I mean you know it's of course probably tidied up and denoised and levels adjusted a bit um, but essentially, this is, a, uh, this is an as-seen, relatively abstract image. We were chatting uh, before we went live about um, photo walks and kind of uh, uh, going on walks with other photographers and everything else with it and things, really. Is this a, a kind of, a, you know, if you were out for a mentoring or a kind of a workshop walk, is this somewhere that you would 
stop and stand and talk about or would you just instantly see it and have to take a photograph and then talk about it what i'm just trying to get how your mind ticks really often um my mind is is formulating an idea but only rather loosely and you know i'll say okay here's a i don't know here's a wildflower field um and I know that some level of blurring and diffusion and distraction and diffraction rather um, will do something with it without being crystal clear. But you, but you do get a feel for the sorts of pictures that you know you will enjoy working on, um, even if you don't have absolute precision uh, about what the result will be. But, uh, but, and sometimes, of course, I mean, I have, a, I have a picture in my mind at the moment, which has a couple of blurred tulips in it. I haven't taken the tulips yet. Um, so I'll, I'll go out and look for tulips that will match this picture that I have in mind. So it's, it's a mixture. It's a mixture. Mm. And, and, often, and frequently I find that I'm visiting pictures that I took maybe years and years ago because I've got some new technique in my mind and I'm looking for, for something that's uh, on record that will, that will respond to that technique. So it's a, it's a bit of a jumble. Okay, question through. Um, as far as colour uh, is concerned within the photograph, do you lean towards colour rather than black and white? Uh, I personally, I do. Yes, I think I do have. I've got two black and white pictures in this um, collection of eight, and sometime and often I will review pictures and just flip them into black and white to see whether they look as though they've got mileage for a black and white direction. But usually my uh, my images kind of rely on. I quite like I quite like um, very minimalist, very pale black and white pictures. Um, but equally, I my tendency is to go to the other extreme and to look for um, really quite vibrant uh, color pictures that depend on the color for their impact. Mm. Uh Question through, do you prefer a, sun, a sunny day for this kind of image or is it just pot, potluck? No, I dread sunny days um, uh, just because of the difficulty of managing uh, lighting and contrast. So um, I'm generally hoping for, uh, I prefer not to have rain, but I would generally, and I prefer not to have wind, but I would prefer uh, overcast lighting. Okay, uh, can you talk about camera and lens, please? Uh, for this picture, um, this was a Panasonic bridge camera. Not not really my go-to camera, but it, it's the one I had with me and and had and has the merit of a very long zoom lens. Uh, I think the equivalent of a 400 mil lens, uh, which is which is useful for a shot like this. My um, my main camera is still a uh, Canon uh, digital uh, um, uh, EOS 5D Mark III still. Uh, and my usual go-to lens for my everyday work is a, is a 100 mil macro lens, because a 100 mil lens is quite a useful thing to have. And the fact that it's macro means I can do my macro work as well. And a 100 mil lens is a great portrait lens, of course. Yeah, it's fabulous um sharp sharpening what's your thoughts on sharpening images in post-production i i have i have a mixed feelings about this i think sometimes we get a bit uh, obsessed with sharpness in images when sharpness isn't really important i have a, i have a sort of um fantasy life in which i go around an art gallery as though i was a camera club judge um, and I say things like, well, the Mona Lisa is very nice, but it's not very sharp um, uh, because it isn't, because it doesn't have to be. It's a painting. Um, so sometimes I think we've, we've got ourselves fixated on sharpness. But equally, I think there are times when a, a photograph makes its impact because it is bitingly sharp, in which case I'll do whatever it takes uh, to make it bitingly sharp, um, ideally by getting it right. Uh, often by focus stacking, and the we talked about AI there. AI, um, there are some there are some clever sharpening um, um, 
there's some clever sharpening software available now like Topaz AI, uh, which will give us sharpness that, that, that we really ought not to be getting out of our images because they didn't start very sharp. So it's, um, it's another rather um, sometimes and sometimes not answer to your question. Sometimes I think sharpness makes an image. Sometimes I think we get into camera club judge mode um, and, uh, and, and, and find that a picture is judged because it's not very sharp, when frankly it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And I think I've got at least one quite blurry picture coming up um, where sharpness really you know, wasn't the point of the picture. We, we see quite a lot of images in Photocritique, funny enough, that are over sharpened. Yes. And it's yes. almost this inherently that they want to get in so close to an image to sharpen it up. And yes. contrast is the first part of sharpness, just like in a film, you know, isn't it? Um, there's a difference between sharpness through a lens, sharpness in contrast, yeah. uh, and sharp and sharpness through light in yes. the contrast in the same way, isn't it? You know, it's it's yeah. those are the first tools before we rely on software to be doing it, I think. But, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you. Good questions, those boys and girls, to start off with. Very well done. Next image. Right. Well, this isn't very sharp, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, you... And it is, and, it, and it's almost monochrome. Um, this is a, a, a treatment I quite often use, which is to, this is the Taj Mahal, of course, uh, although the Taj Mahal doesn't actually look quite like this. Um, this is a picture in which I've added extreme blurring, in this case um, uh, vertical Photoshop motion blur, and then just painted back sharpness in the centre where I felt, you know, the, the eye had to settle. Um, and it's also, it's a mirrored image. The right-hand half of my picture was much better than the left-hand half, so at the um, uh, the picture is flipped over to give me a, a, a symmetrical image and as a result it's uh, it's not really a picture of the Taj Mahal it's a picture based on the Taj Mahal um, and the um, oh and having blurred the image um, vertically the uh, some some sharpness or at least some identity is restored to the image by dropping the line edges of the original picture back on so there's a degree of um, of identity uh, restored just by 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 dropping the edges back on, and of course painting them out on the sides there, and just restoring them where we needed you know a degree of um, of precision still to exist. So that's it really, and it's a treatment I've used on on, on quite a few uh, pictures. It, it it's particularly useful um, where the the scene is reasonably well known, so you know you 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 you, you can you kind of know it's the Taj Mahal, um, and you can relax and and then just look at it as a picture instead of trying to work out well well where is it and is it an interesting place it doesn't really matter uh, you can just look at the picture. You know when you've got an iconic location like this, it's very hard to be original as well, isn't it? Because yes, we've yes. well I haven't been there, but I'm sure millions of people have been there and taken the same photograph in some way um, and trying to come up with a new take on it is a different kind of vision isn't it it's it is taking it beyond that and do you think you need time to contemplate this kind of what could i do with this image or or are you a quite willing to sit there for hours and just actually have a little bit of fiddle and actually see where you end up. How does it work for you? At the, at the taking stage, and this would be fairly typical of a picture like this, I just don't have very much time because my wife is nagging me to, um, to get on with it. Um, so the, 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 the starting picture in a sense is to be honest, little more than a snapshot, you know, it's the picture everyone gets when they go through the gates and takes a picture of the Taj Mahal. So it's it's revisiting afterwards. But the but the basic treatment that I will often use um, where the subject will take it is for this directional blurring. It doesn't have to be buildings, you know, sometimes things like trees and so on, uh, or, or sometimes landscapes where your lines are, are horizontal rather than vertical. 
but I, if, if the picture is, uh, lends itself to, um, to directional blurring, then I will often go for extreme directional blurring with this business of restoring detail by putting the line edges back on um, and just uh, using opacity adjustment, uh, you know, through a layer mask um, to, uh, to, to, to bring identity back into the picture where it was needed. Good. Yeah, no questions on that one. Really good. Love that. Next image. Right. Uh, well, this is um, I, I, a lot of my photography is flower photography. And just as you were saying about uh, buildings there, Mark, I think the challenge in flower photography is is how you're going to be different. I remember when I was thinking about putting a, a, a fellowship panel together myself, and in fact, I did put a fellowship panel together, and uh, the, the fellowship advisors gave me some advice, and it was don't do flowers um, because you know we've seen flowers. So the challenge was to produce flower images that were different. Um, so I ended up. Um, uh, microwave pressing flowers, uh, drying flowers, and in this case, embedding flowers in ice. So this is a section of um, a, a Lysianthus uh, frozen, and then photographed with some uh, some backlighting, as well as some front lighting. Um, just looking for, in a way, the definition of abstraction. Uh, you know, an image that's that's dependent on shape and form and line and color. So, and I think, um, I, I like two things about frozen flowers. One is that I think the, the, the bubbles in the ice, uh, for me, add interest to the picture. Um, and the second is that as the, as, the, um, as, as, the, as the picture, as the flower recedes into the ice, you get a sort of artificial sense of depth about it. Even if the picture is sharp throughout, the, uh, the, 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 there's a sort of artificial shallow depth of field created by recession into the ice. So I do, so I like frozen flower pictures. Um, and this is a relatively abstract example of that. I've got to say, you won't like mine because mine was a pathetic uh, uh, attempt at it, to be honest, in lockdown. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we couldn't have models in at some stage, it was like, okay, so what are we going to do next week? <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah we 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 got some roses and we froze them and we went this is pretty crap you know <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not as easy as it looks i i'm i i can actually say that i mean have you got any advice on anybody actually trying to take a frozen flower is um, there a special water or anything or is it defrosting? Well, how's it work well, well, this is something i have i have worked with with groups on this subject uh, although of course there's a little bit how long you wait uh, while while uh, the whole thing freezes. So I've often pre-frozen uh, stuff. Um, so and and people have experimented with all sorts of what. Well, some people don't like the bubbling in the water, so they use <clears throat> uh, boiled and deionized water. Um, some people like the, um, the the texture of the ice to be even more dramatic. Um, so one technique that I do actually quite like is as soon as you get the thing out the freezer. Uh, you just quickly drop it into hot water and then you get um, uh, uh, shatter lines um, scattered throughout the image as well which which can be can be very effective my so my advice would be um, as you've experienced mark prepare for failures because they don't always work out um, and remember that when you put a flower into a container of water it will stubbornly float um, so make sure you devise some way to anchor it down uh, before you add the water. Uh, and remember that the anchor will appear in the picture unless you're, um, uh, unless you're careful. And then I have also found that once you've got your container out of the, the, the freezer and set it up, um, you know, with lighting that you think will work for it, you sometimes have to wait a long time for the uh, enough ice on the surface to have melted. Just it, usually the pictures are best when the flower is very close to the surface of the ice and uh, in fact is sometimes just emerging beyond it. So uh, patience is, uh, is a virtue here. Mm. Not, a, not a virtue I'm very good at. 
by the way, but um, it, but it, they, it can be a slow process. On a personal note for a minute, is this the kind of image, because uh, I love in the colour, you know, um, and I love triptychs and mm. quads and all that kind of thing. Is this something that you would do colour shift with and, and kind of actually have a, ser a series or? Yes, is yes, yes, yeah? I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, often these pictures have much more impact as, as collections, as panels mm. or as, as triptychs or whatever you choose. Yeah. Love that. Um, the frozen flower, was the daylight used? And if not, what li lighting was in place? Yes, it, lighting is, is often tricky with these things. Um, I, well, I, once I've taken my translucent container with my frozen flower out of the freezer, um, I usually put the, the whole thing just onto a light box. So I've got some lighting from below. Um, but lighting only from below it, it just doesn't work. The, the, the lighting then looks rather strangely um, severe. So I will normally require some very diffuse lighting from above. And it's like, you know, the question about your question about do you want a sunny day? No, I want very dull lighting. And often um, a picture like this will be almost almost in darkness. Um, you know, with very, very gentle lighting, but it's not going to move anywhere. So, you know, if the exposure is, you know, two or three seconds, that's not a problem. Uh, so, yeah, dull, dull, dull lighting would be my answer. A uh, couple of questions coming through, or quite a few, in fact. <clears throat> um, tone and saturation uh, when you print, is it something that you have to adjust from what you see on your screen? How many times would you print an image? before you find it's the right one yes that that's a, that's a, a, a challenging question mm. um i i have i've managed to get tolerable calibration between my uh, monitor and my printer so i'm and you know i i do often have people saying to me you know that, that, that the printer's printing too dark um, well, it's because they brightened their image too much on screen. So often adjusting a screen so that the image is the way it will be printing, printed it, it is disappointing because, uh, you know, screens are often adjusted to give us the greatest vibrancy, uh, but that's not the way the image actually turns out to be when you look at it uh, as a print. So I've more or less got that right. Um, and I often tell myself, well, let's make a few um, uh, test prints or print a few test strip, strips to make sure I've got everything right. I usually um, ignore my own advice and um, print at great expense a number of images, which I then throw away um, because they're not right. <laughs> um, Sorry, but, I'm, la I'm laughing because one of the comments has come through. Yeah, just don't do what Mark did live. Oh, really? <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, guys. Oh, at least that was honest on the day, yeah. Uh, um, uh, calibration. Uh, you're talking about light and dark and things. We may as well talk about that now. Um, calibration, do you use calibrated software or what do you do to match your printer to the screen? Uh, I calibrate the screen not as often as the spider software nags me to do. Um, but periodically, um, and in, uh, and I don't. I usually don't now go to the trouble of uh, of, of creating my own paper profiles um, because I find that the range of profiles in my printer settings matches near enough the range of papers that I use. So I, I settle for even if I'm actually technically using. Uh, an Epsom printer profile and a Hallamula paper, um, I, I now know that, that the two match well enough from trial and error. So it's I, I default into things I'm used to, and I'm used I'm now used to knowing what a picture I'm seeing on screen will look like run through a uh, as a printed uh, image using a particular paper and a particular uh, profile. 
so it's it's been trial and error to settle into, uh, into into what I found works. So I don't, to be honest, I don't go through any of the um, the very exotic and admirable uh, calibration techniques that some people do. I calibrate the screen, um, and I'm and I now know what printer profiles will work for various papers, and that's that's to be honest about as technical as I get. Okay, uh, is the rose paper printed on watercolor paper? Paper. Is the rose paper printed on watercolor paper? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I've, I mean, a picture like this will print perfectly well onto gloss paper, but I think it's rather nice if I'm understanding what you mean by um, watercolor paper. Uh, on, Texture um, paper, I think it is. Yes, yeah, yeah yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in that same breath, then, for a minute, um, somebody's saying about. They love what they have coming out of the printer, but, okay, we'll just read the question. I like what I get out of the printer, but it always looks better because of the textured pay, pay paper. Any advice on getting this effect so I can show it on screen? <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, it is, it is a, it's a very uh, interesting um, question, um, and I'm not, certain that I know the answer except to suggest that you try applying something like a, a light canvas texture to the image. Of course, you, you know, you will want to remove that texture before printing because you're then going to rely on the paper for the texture. Um, but um, I think adding adding texture through, um, I, I use Photoshop through uh, Photoshop's texturizer, which gives you the ability to choose the textured paper. I've got I've got some photographs of textured paper, um, which I will often use to texturize the image. So that, that's a very interesting question. I've never actually mm. thought about having a different picture to to display like this from the one that I then go ahead to print. Yeah, it's it's, it's a nice idea. I, I I'd say well, if you like what you're getting out of the printer. Try yeah. and photograph it. Try and photograph it and see if it translates yeah. on onto the screen for you. Obviously, the trouble is we're looking at a backlit Im image compared yes. to a frontlit image, yes. isn't it? So yes. they yes. never really have the same exact yes. look. Yes. Um, but I definitely give it a go uh, and just see if it's light because I, 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 as soon as I read the question, I fully understood what you're on about with that. Okay, uh, we're back into color. Uh, any advice on setting up the camera for this kind of Im image? to get near out of camera color. I think what they mean is that basically so they don't have to tweak it in any software. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a bit timid in my answer here. Um, I, I usually don't fiddle around with the white balance settings in my camera, but I do take pictures in RAW um, and then make any color adjustments that I feel are necessary in in a, in a raw editor. So I my my preference, to be honest, is to is to go for the the, the simplest, quickest, straight out of the camera option um, in when I'm photo, when I'm taking the photograph, and then to head into my comfort zone, which is uh, software, and to make my color adjustments there. And of course, if we're in raw. And we've still got all of the uh, the, the flexibility we need in, uh, in in color balance. Okay. So I'm more uh, I'm more concerned about exposure, I think, than about uh, color balance. Mm. <clears throat> uh, last question on this image, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Um, just flipping deleted it. We'll come back to it. I'll go, I'll have to try and recover the question. We'll come back to it. Let's go to the next image. Right. With a couple of these pictures, I realise I'm uh, we're perhaps pushing the, the luck on on the definition of abstract. I'm not sure this is truly an abstract, um, but I wanted <clears throat> first of all I wanted to replicate a picture from the, the 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 Vanitas school of art. This is this is the Victorian uh, series of paintings to remind us of human mortality, and they invariably included um, bell book and candle. Um, and I wanted an excuse to buy a skull. So um, here, here, here is my use of uh, of, uh, of my plastic skull. 
um, it's it's a picture with with some defects, but it was it's also one of the most difficult pictures I have ever taken. Um, it is lit virtually entirely by that candlelight, so one of the challenges was not to breathe and to make the candle flicker. Um, and um, other than that, it is pretty much as seen, except that faffing around with it to get the setup and the composition and the exposure right uh, was very tricky. But I'm sort of comfortable that, that this is this is my presentation of uh, of the Vanitas style. Um, I, I haven't found that question. If your question hasn't been asked and you think I've missed it, can you just re-put it in there for me about the flower, please? Sorry about that. Um, painting. Um, do you find yourself being drawn to a certain style of artist and then reflecting that in your photography? Yes, <clears throat> I'm. I've 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 often very flattered when <clears throat> people <laughs> ask me where I get ideas from, um, and the idea and and, and I and I, I like to think that sometimes I do have genuine new creative thoughts about images. Uh, but often there's a degree of plagiarism involved in which I've seen a picture or an advertisement or something or other. And I think, well, you know, that that is that is an interesting use of form or um, composition or color or, or, or impact or whatever it is. And so I'll try to adopt that um, in, into my own work. So uh, and I am typically drawn to, I suppose, impressionist and abstract painting. And I think that um, you know, time in an art gallery is often well spent. You, even if you just get drawn to, you know, just one, maybe two pictures, um, because they will they, they'll just trigger your, your your visual processes into thinking. Actually, that that is a that is a direction I could head in. Mm. And people like Hockney, of course, may you know make this extraordinary use of uh, of color and composition in ways that you don't want to. To directly copy, and be hard pressed to do that, but which do give you directions to follow and to interpret in in your own ways. So, uh, so yes, I would say um, probably impressionistic and um, and all sorts of abstract images um, give, give me directions that I like to follow. Okay, the questions come through. Uh, there's a few more, but um, bubbles. Uh, in the picture, can they be removed by dust and scratches successfully? Bubbles in the ice picture? I think that's what, yeah. I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, I think, I did, I did mention, I, I think maybe I got distracted. Um, people do, um, I, I, oh yes, I mentioned that you can get <clears throat> extra uh, ice texture by causing the ice to shatter. Um, yeah. Some people want the opposite um, and want absolutely pure water, in which case boiled and deionized water. And some people use carbonated water to get even more bubbles. So um, although it's difficult to eliminate the uh, the bubbles entirely, in my experience, and, and I don't mind that because I don't mind them, um, I, I think it would be very, I, I mean, you can do a lot in Photoshop with blemishes, but I think it would be a tough call to do that to a bubbly ice. Yeah. I, 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 if you're going for a painterly effect, I think you can get away with it without any trouble because obviously it'll just kind of merge everything, isn't it, really? You, you'll definitely do it, but I don't think you'll end up with any sharpness to an image and things, really. No. Uh, okay. Uh, Colour balance uh, set up for this kind of image, uh, the skull. As I mentioned earlier, I tend just to settle for cameras uh, auto white balance, uh, but then we'll, we'll very, very often change that white balance in the raw editor. And here, I, I almost certainly would have done this here. Um, in fact, I have <laughs> quite a lot of versions of this picture with, uh, with various different software treatments. Uh, I, I obviously felt that a degree of sort of warm yellowness about the lighting that was necessary to um, uh, 
just to get the sort of cam the, the candle glow feel about it all. And depth of field for this kind of image, focus stacking in in inverted uh, commas there. Uh, uh, well, yes and no. Yes, in general, no, as it happens for this particular picture, um, because this the the lighting was so variable um, with this picture and the uh, the exposure so long. Uh, that I decided to settle for um, uh, a, a, um, probably a, a sort of f um, uh, probably about an f20 image um, and settled for the slight softness that uh, that you get as a result of that, but reasonable depth of field. And again, if you look at this picture, it's not particularly sharp, um, and I'm the skull is reasonably sharp, but I'm not too worried about that. I don't think um, sharpness is, uh, sh I don't think sharpness throughout is too critical for this image. And in fact, just before we move on, um, Hans just asked another question. Since there was uh, so little light, what camera settings did you use? Warm, warm light balance, high ISO, what length of exposure? Any ideas? Uh, Yes, a, a good question. Well, to get a, a tolerable uh, depth of field, given that I wasn't stacking, um, I, I, I think this would be about f20. Um, the, um, th there's a limit to how long an exposure you can um, you, you can put up with here because the candle will flicker. So I think um, I probably settled for an exposure of, I would guess, I, I seem to recall about three seconds um, and even that did require, because this is a very dark, um, a, a, um, a, a very high uh, ISO. I used to be obsessed with having um, low ISOs for some reason. It was a bit of a phobia. Um, and now if I have to push the ISO to a thousand or so, then, then fine. If, if it delivers the image, then I'll settle for that. I think if exposure is correct, you can get away with murder with ISO. Yes. It's just yes. when they're... Uh, underexposed really and you push it up isn't it really I think that's it yes. with it. Great the paper curl? Yes this is <laughs> this is a paper curl. Um, I, I mentioned that I do I often do like um, very colorful pictures but I also like minimalist uh, pictures with not much in them so I did take a series of uh, pictures just of bits of torn paper and this is quite simply an example of one of those. Um, here we, this is of course very shallow depth of field, but something has to be passably sharp, and that's just the leading torn edge of the paper. And I was keen that the paper just bled out to pure white. Um, and um, this again, I think, Mark, is one of those pictures which benefits uh, as a as a triptych or as a, or as a panel, because then they become, you know, slightly more intriguing. So this is this is very much one of a series, um, but I think it has a, a, a for me, a feeling of um, minimalist um, depth about it that I personally quite like. And certainly, um, although you can't really see it here, and there's a good question there, um, because this picture prints nicely onto textured paper. It's tailor-made for that. Um, but of course, you don't really see that looking at the on-screen image. So it might be interesting to have a version um, in which I've just added a little bit of overall texture. I'll give that a try. Uh, question coming through. Do you run a blog at all? Is there somewhere that you um, talk about your photographs in depth? Uh, I don't really. I am um, shamefully old school and old fashioned about blogs and social media and so on. Um, but I do have a book in which I talk about this sort of thing, which is which is called, uh, what's it called? Um, Creative and Experimental Photography. Is that the, the new one or is that the Mac? No, that's uh, the, the new Mac one, Pro? yes. The new yeah, one. We'll get to that in a minute, guys. Uh, um, I've got a link read, uh, ready for you, in fact, while we're talking about the next photograph. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, colour on this, though, this is superb, isn't it, really? You know, when you're looking into greys and everything else, um, kind of colour balance, this is an image that you'll either see it's clean white or you want a bit of tone with it and things. Would you, do you like a little bit of tone? Would you look at this image and went, I want it crystal clean? Or would you go for something a little bit more with a slight tint? How does your 
your brain work? That's a question from me, of course. Uh, sometimes I definitely do add a slight tint to monochrome pictures. In fact, often I do. In this case, I didn't. Uh, my feeling was this is white paper and needed to look like white paper. So I, um, I went for as white as I could sensibly be. Sorry, I'm just putting the link in. Uh, I may as well just show you the page I'm on. Where's my thing gone? Um, oh, look at that. There's the book. This is John's book, yeah? Uh, so I'll just put the Amazon link in. Uh, the, uh, there's no uh, benefit in using the link. It's just a quick way for you. I haven't put... That's right. Yeah, thank you, Mark. A pleasure. I haven't put anything... Um, to earn me any money on it, I promise you. Um, <laughs> so if you just actually do a search on uh, uh, John Hub uh, John Humphrey Creative Experimental Photography and Art Techniques, you'll find uh, you'll find it there. Any? What was your other book? Did you say the macro one? Uh, yes, uh, it's a uh, uh, close up and macro photography, and there would be some observation about. I mean that that paper curl was itself a close up picture. I think I think in fact that the paper curl probably is in the um, close up and macro book where I do also talk about, uh, of course, lighting and composition. Uh, let's just see if it's there for uh, John Humphrey. Uh, close up and macro, do you say? Yes. Just so people can see the cover. That's there the black is. one? Yep. So there's the, guy, uh, the other one, guys and things, really. So uh, you can have a little look once we finished. Sorry about that, John. Just while you mentioned it, we might as well. No, that's I, uh, I wasn't expecting um, a, a big book plug. Thank you very much. No, pleasure, pleasure. Um, any tips on uh, doing the likes of the paper curl? I quite like that idea, to be honest. So uh, I think we might have a project coming on here, boys and girls. Um, any tips on the curling? Uh, the, well, the, the, the curling first came to mind when I was guillotining some photographic paper and, you know, the little sliver that you, um, you slice off tends to automatically curl up. Um, but frankly, if you take a bit of paper and um, you know just drag it under a ruler, it will curl quite nicely. Um, so my tip would be this. The difficult thing is not the curl, it's the ragged edge. The ragged edge. Um, yeah. uh, that's very difficult to tear paper with a nice ragged edge. However, you can buy ragged edged rulers. Um, I think uh, Permajet sell one. Uh, with a couple of different <laughs> levels of raggedness. Um, so you just um, tear your paper uh, against the ruler and that will give you a, a much more controllable ragged edge. Most of the watercolour fine art paper, paper in fact, uh, that you'll buy down the art shops, they are all torn edge. Very few they, uh, yes. are, yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, the yes. pulp ones, yep. your, just uh, right. especially the watercolour. And in fact, you can, I'm just trying to think, did Dela do it? There's one of them that make a pad of um, torn edge yep. uh, watercolor yep. paper as well with it and things really. Yep. So if you yes, torn edges are often used in in painting, of course. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. You, you undoubtedly you can just buy torn paper. Uh, speaking about uh, torn for a minute and kind of overlay, and you you, you talked about uh, hock hockney and so on. Um, are you a fan of montage in yourself at all, or? Yes. Yes. Um, I, um, in fact, I remember showing a series of pictures which I called double exposure pictures until someone said, well, they're not double exposure, are they? <laughs> uh, you've done them in Photoshop in layers. Um, so I have to acknowledge that they are um, montages or, mm. or, or whatever the correct term would be. But yes, I absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. it's often a very, I don't think there are any here, but I think it's often a very effective way of, um, uh, of, of producing arty images. Mm, I, I fell in love with Sam Haskins' uh, photography uh, in my young youth, as it were, and uh, called Photogram, and that yes. and that was yes. absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, really did inspire me quite a lot, especially, especially as I was doing my A level art at the time and things. Really, photography really wasn't a part of the arts then, and it was kind of being rebelled against. Um, but uh, again, when you start to look at how the Warhols, the Hockneys, you know, the, the kind of the artists use photography and then how photographers used photographs in art. I, I think it's a really 
great exploratory there uh, and things really. Right, next uh, next image, John. This is this has slipped in really because I wanted to put some variety into these pictures and um, it's uh, it's not, I guess, really abstract. Um, it's one of my very, very few street photographs. As it happens, it was taken in Havana. Um, but I felt that um, the uh, the workmen dressed in blue with their blue scaffolding um, against this sepia uh, wall mural um, just had to be an opportunity to, uh, to to put it on record. So this is uh, kind of my one and only street photograph. And um, and I think you know it for me it works because the leading lines um, from the base are just right. Um, I, I, the uh, the lovely coincidence of blue scaffolding and men dressed in blue um, against um, a, a grainy sepia wall seemed to me just to be uh, too good an opportunity to miss. So my apologies that it's probably not strictly abstract, I guess not really abstract at all, um, but I felt it would add just a bit of variety in the pictures we were looking at this evening. I think Havana was one of the best photo walks I've ever, I've ever done. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you yep. couldn't help but take photographs. Uh, um, it's just a stunningly interesting place. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I could have. Uh, we only went for three days there in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, we were there on holiday and everything else, and we paid uh, to get a, a guide <laughs> uh, to drive us up there and basically uh, find us accommodation and kind of spend three uh, three days up there. And it was absolutely. You know, I, I'm not sure if you're like, but when I walk the streets, I can go a little bit blind. I don't mm. know. I'm not fully aware what's going on around me because I'm so interested in what I'm photographing and things, really. And and my wife just couldn't believe that, you know, she's used to me walking around and I'm sure your partner is as well. But it, 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 you just get so, oh, my gosh, there's a photograph there and you're, there's, you're people watching and, and you're just doing stuff. But I, I feel I've never felt so safe, in fact. Uh, yeah. in, a, in such a big city now Mexico is a different thing altogether isn't it you know but um, yeah Havana uh, if it can be photographed still unspoiled it's definitely a photo destination I think uh, I agree it's a lovely friendly safe unexploitive place yeah de-americanized okay yeah last two images yeah. the flower okay uh, well here we are um, uh, a black and white picture of a marsh marigold. Uh, the original picture um, distorted and displaced someone you, uh, somewhat using displacement mapping, in which you use a, a textured image to displace the direction of the original picture. Um, sharpness brushed back into the center, and then the whole thing dropped onto um, a, a, a texture of a textured wall. So uh, very dependent on extreme texturing and not at all dependent on sharpness. Um, nothing in the picture is very sharp, but the center I think needs to be sharper than everything else. So you've got something to, um, to settle on. I think this is a good example. We often talk in Photogratique about there's uh, an image that is slightly missing a white or slightly missing a black. And for those photographers who've been on photo critiques for me and they're saying, oh, but this is very gray, it's not. There's actually a pure white in there and there is a, a near deep black. Uh, and I think that's a, you know, that's the contrast by itself, isn't it? That actually simulates a sharpness with a very, very yeah. soft finish. But yes. um, yeah. love that with it. A couple of questions. So how would you print this on plain paper or on a textured paper again? Definitely on textured paper. I can understand why you asked the question. It is it is so textured that I think you could ask yourself the question, are you going to be really overdoing it if you go for additional texture with textured paper? Uh, but this picture suits itself very well, actually, to being on textured paper as well. So in this case, I, I totally understand why you're asking. I would still go for a textured uh, print. The question, uh, as far as does your printer print with multiple blacks, or is it a combination of colours? It has three black inks in it, um, but I don't change any settings. So I think, although I, I'm, no, I'm no expert on how 
um, digital printers work. They are extraordinary things. I suspect it is using some colored inks here to, uh, to do this as well. Uh, do you have a preferred brand of paper? Um, no, I'm going to I'm going to cop out a, a bit here. I have I'm used to I have I have no I, I don't wave a flag for any any camera or any software or any papers at all. Uh, I happen to have Epson printers and I'm used to my Epson printer, so I do often use Epson papers simply because the profiles by definition are, are built in and are correct. But I do also. Uh, use, as I think you mentioned, uh, Mark Hammermuller papers and uh, a number of uh, Permajet papers. For instance, the textured paper, I think it's Permajet, I think they call it Permajet Museum, is just very gently textured and, um, uh, and there's a paper I quite like. Um, and there's also a, a cold press, which is an Innova paper, which so um, I, I I don't like using too many papers because there are just there's just too many to choose from. But uh, I I do like a range of, of, of available textures. What uh, what size do you print up to yourself? Uh, I can and sometimes do print up to A2, but that would be relatively unusual. So mostly I will be printing at more like A3 size, something like that. Most of the pro labs do a print service anyway, isn't it? If you don't have a big enough printer of yourself, if oh, you yeah. can try and find a, a, you know, even if you only do up to A4 yourself, let's say, if yes. you can find a paper that most of the pro, a, a Mayu Sim Lab, um, yeah, yeah, and, and basically they do a, a whole huge range of uh, fine art papers and things really, and they, and if you find a paper that you print on an A4 and you like it, you can confidently go go for it. Um, I think it's photo rag. I usually go for my color yep. images when I go to Sim Lab. Um, it's got a rougher texture, but that's just a personal thing again, and, and it has to be personal to you, isn't it? And the and the professional labs know what they're doing so well that you will get fabulous uh, results from them. Yeah, yeah, but, um, great. Uh, last image. And finally, um, this picture is called Spoon and Fork um, on Coloured Pencils. Um, and that's what it is. It is a spoon and a fork resting on a bed of coloured pencils. Um, a couple of things about it, though. Uh, first of all, coloured pencils actually don't stack up as well as you might want them to. So uh, this is um, ultimately um, spoon and fork on a picture of colored pencils. Uh, so that's a printed backdrop. Um, second uh, is that if you put a spoon and a fork next to each other, they reflect in each other. So uh, you actually can't photograph them side by side like this. You have to take two pictures and um, put them together later. And the second is that a photograph like this will show up the slightest blemishes in your cutlery, so you have to get out the, the your, your best. You have to get you have to get out the guest set um, to um, to have nice shiny smooth surfaces. Yeah, go and buy a nice spoon and fork from uh, John Lewis's and take it back the next day. Um, Don't let anyone touch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, white gloves all the way through. <laughs> yes. yeah, through uh, it, there's there, there's a technique we're here where you can actually use like a, a laptop screen or a um, a monitor screen behind in a mirror um, uh, to actually do uh, if 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 you wanted to play around with this kind of idea. I'm not sure how well that would work, but I know it's a technique we've used with jewellery um, to actually photograph through and things really. But uh, yeah, that that is a really great image to add on because it truly is abstract, isn't it? I think until you say it's a fork and a spoon. It's it's almost impossible at first glance to actually work out what the hell it is kind of thing with it. Um, do you find it hard when you're trying to select images for the likes of a book and things of what images to publish and what images not to? Yes, uh, but I think it's a discipline that is quite important. Uh, one of the things that I have a bit of an aversion to is when someone asks me to look at their pictures, often on on software like Flickr or whatever, 
and they and they want me to look at hundreds and sometimes thousands of pictures and i and i often think well you know hold on it's your job to to pick out the pictures that you'd like me to see not require me to do that job for you so it's it's it is painful <laughs> rejecting your own pictures but i think that is really one of our jobs so yeah i do find it difficult and painful but necessary very good um how how would you assess the color balance sorry ask the exact question mark don't tweak it color in this image how would you know what is correct and what is not well that that's now that is a very interesting question um and uh, i remember you know looking at uh, printing for instance some pictures like this or um or, or looking at them on screen and making some adjustments and thinking well that's actually not the color of the of the of the subject that i took but on the other hand it's actually a bit better um or or different or more interesting so uh, i i think color balance in something like this is probably not very important if you like what you see um and and sometimes you can tweak things so they're quite unrealistic but if they're abstract that's kind kind of the, the, the point of the exercise very good a couple of questions uh, still here to finish off with if that's okay uh do you find yourself oversaturating images that are more abstract and more use of subtle color in things that aren't yes yes i do uh, often oversaturate um and probably um uh, often overdo it and uh, you know you, you know, when you if you go into um, hue and saturation adjustments in Photoshop, you can get terribly excited uh, by going for radically different colors and you know dramatic oversaturation. And then you know if you allow a bit of time to pass, you will realize that you you probably pushed your luck too far there. So yes, I do, and sometimes I recognize the folly of my ways. Okay. Um, do you ever have a problem with with printing such a saturated image? I, I think they mean the last photograph. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. The the um, that 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 particular picture would have been very well suited, I think, to good old uh, gloss Cibachrome, wouldn't it? Cibachrome. Just going to say the same. <laughs> yeah. And, and re so here, I certainly wouldn't use a textured paper. I would go for the uh, the, uh, the the glossiest gloss I could get away with. I think this would look great on a metallic print. Oh, oh yes, it might work on metallic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, not, not just a hard metallic. I'm on about you. You can actually get a metallic uh, uh, print, print as it were, kind of thing with it. So I definitely, yes. it's, yeah. you know, if you are going to go down this route, guys, print finish presentation, blah blah blah, is 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 the next level, isn't it? You know, um, yeah. it's again, it's the next level of your personality coming out in the finished image. So don't. There's no perfection. It's only your perfection that's key with it. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, photo walk. Funny enough, we had some really good questions on photo walks a couple of week week ago. Funny enough, um, I'm going to do a photo walk this weekend with some friends, and like the idea of abstract being inspired by John. Um, any tips, John, on what to start with? uh it will it will depend uh, where you're walking of course uh, if it was me i would be very interested in finding things that would suit themselves to directional blurring and i would do two things first of all i would take pictures that i knew i could look at on screen and uh, and, and uh, fiddle with in that way but i would also experiment with some um, uh, some intentional uh, camera movement so i would try for a few um slow shutter speed depending on you know whether your lines are, uh, are vertical or horizontal uh, i would try a bit of uh, motion panning with a shutter speed of i don't know eighth of a second something like that and see what you get in camera we haven't had it you know in these in these few pictures i haven't looked at um, any in camera techniques but in camera motion blurring is great fun to do uh, as is um, a genuine multiple exposures. And in fact, I've just uh, loaded an app onto my uh, uh, my smartphone, uh, which will build up um, multiple exposures in in camera, so you can view what you're getting as you um, 
as you superimpose one picture onto another. And of course, it does a miraculous job of adjusting the exposure and so on as you go. So, um, so a bit of both, a bit of uh, in-camera um, abstraction and uh, take pictures that will suit themselves to, um, uh, to in, in, my, in my personal case, uh, to blurring treatments. I, I kind of go to uh, reflections, textures, yeah. contrast, yeah. tone, uh, and color. Those are the kind of things. So if I'm stuck, if I've walked too far, <laughs> I will walk backwards. Uh, the, uh, one of our landscape uh, masters, uh, he once I said, what's, what's the best tip you can ever give to a, somebody who's just getting out in landscape? He said, look behind you. You've probably just walked past it. Uh, and, and from this day, every time I walk back, I do walk backwards or at least look behind me anyway. But I think things like reflections, uh, uh, for me, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a go to. I actually like um, if I'm doing street photography, I actually like um, ad adverts. I find that adverts are often completely out of con of context, and it's quite easy to get quite a dramatic image um, around some of the windows of shops or whatever it is, where they've got kind of these window peels on and things. Really, I think that's a really good good one. Do you know what? I'm really glad we've had once more discussions on photo walks. So very well done with you guys. Um, just, just to, Mark, just to add to that, because some of my nicest abs abstract pictures, I think, are of um, uh, advertising hoardings in which the advert has been torn off. So you get some nice uh, abstract ragged edges and, you know, yeah. bits of bits of color and just little bits of wording. So you might you might well spot abstracts if that's what yeah. you're looking for. If you want to go for that, it's Italy. <laughs> Everything seems to be falling off. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, nothing like, a, nothing like a, bit of, a, bit of, a bit of decay is what you're looking for. Yeah, natural, creative yeah. decay. Yeah, yeah, kind of thing with it. Uh, okay, a couple of questions to finish off with. Uh, go uh, go to lens again, please, John. Uh, my well, I would say that I have two go to lenses. I suppose my fa if I was stuck on a desert island with only one lens, it would be my uh, hundred mil macro lens. Um, if I was out on a on a trip where I needed versatility, I would sacrifice quality and go for a, a longish uh, range zoom lens. Um, just because I know a lot of people say, you know, the discipline of going out with a single um, prime fixed focal length lens is a is a great discipline, and it is. But I would personally want the versatility of um, of reasonable zoom. Even though we chatted about it, um, somebody's asked it. What's your per your personal future with AI or not? Um, I hope it will be without AI, but I accept for the ability of AI. If we're including this in the context of AI, to get very sophisticated sharpening and denoising. I'm happy going that far. I I don't want AI barging in and doing my creativity for me, but I fear that may be a route that we're going to have to um, to manage somehow or other. Okay. Uh, would you recommend trying to print images yourself or just outsource them? I love printing my own images, um, partly because I'm impatient and I want to see fairly quickly whether they print well. And I find that it's satisfying to, um, you know, to see this miracle of the thing on screen turning into a print before your eyes. But if if what you want is very high quality prints to exhibit or to hang on your wall, there's no question, as you've said, Mark, that uh, outsourced quality printers will do a an extremely good job. And I and, I, and a couple of my photographer friends only outsource their printing. Um, and that's fine. They produce great images. I think a part of the creativity is creating the print yourself, though, isn't it? It's a bit like the darkroom days. For me, it um, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, um, I think having the ability to kind of what happens if I do this to it? Yeah, um, I, I, I love that. Uh, and, and it can be quite expensive um, if you kind of outsource stuff and then you kind of start scratching and ripping and watering and 
damping and you know you know doing stupid things and things plus at times the the print has almost sealed itself too quickly for you to be able to do anything with we were chatting about you know fine art paper from the the art uh, the art shop the benefit of an uncoated paper is that you get to do things to it instead yeah. of it kind of yeah. sealing yeah. itself too fast with it and things but um again it's a personality and i would just have a look on marketplace who, who asked that question evan um have a look on marketplace and just see if you can buy yourself a cheap printer then and just um don't buy expensive paper to go into a cheap print a printer uh yet do you know what i mean you don't want to kind of buy a, a, a you know the best lens possible and stick it on a crappy body uh, you've got to have some kind of balance but you know when you're starting to experiment with things don't invest too heavily to begin with uh, and so you can have a little bit of a play time with them things really. okay uh, john uh, future projects what have you got in mind is there another book coming uh, from yes I, well, I, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping so i what i have found is that um uh, when I show people pictures, they are um, particularly interested in the technique, not particularly in the philosophy or the uh, or the reasoning or anything. Uh, so I just thought it would be nice to uh, to produce almost a sort of photography recipe book. You know, here's the here's here's the starting picture, here's the final picture, here's the recipe that takes you from A to B. So um, I just need to find a publisher that is equally excited about that. Brilliant. John, on behalf of myself and the Academy and everybody today, thank you so, so much for being with us. Uh, I'm, I was so chuffed when Laura said that you'd agreed uh, to say yes. So thank you very, very much. And thanks for everybody joining us live. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great. As I said, uh, it'll be record it's recorded for our members that will be available on Friday for you. Um, it'll be on YouTube to re-watch um, in about two weeks' time. Thank you, John. Cheers, bud. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, too. Take Go care. on buy John's book now. I've put the plug in. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great Bye -bye. night, wherever, wherever you are. Take, take care.